that note, boys. Big pile of lions. He's looking absolutely fine. No injuries there apart from a couple of old scratches. The male that did have the scratches around his eye and his floppy ear, it was on his right side. I can't manage to see the rest of them. I'm trying to look at the same time and see if I see a lioness lying in the shade, but I think it's safe to say she's disappeared off. One foot sticking up in the air. <laughs> and one very comfortable line. I, it always amazes me that they decide to, to lie head to bottom because surely the smell cannot be all that appealing. You'd think that they'd sort of lie with their heads in a line or something, but obviously that doesn't bother the lions too much. Now just to finish up our spate of updates on the lions of the area, Nikunj, you were you mentioned that one of the young lions from the Salala Pride had gone missing about two weeks ago. And you're wondering if I have an update. I actually have a wonderful update on that front. I was convinced that that young male had been killed and I'm really really happy to say that he hasn't been. He is alive and well and in fact reunited with the rest of the Pride on Londolozi. Not only that, but they were also seen with the two older females from the Salala Pride that were busy mating with the Matimba males when we saw the breakaway group. So fantastic news. I thought that with his injury, I really honestly thought that he was probably going to have died. He would have been caught by the Birmingham boys. He had, if you remember, he had that big cut along the edge of his bottom. It looked very painful and it was when I first saw him, it was with Brian actually, when I first saw him they were looking very thin and he was struggling to keep up with the rest of the pride. But I'm thrilled to say I was completely wrong. He is absolutely fine. His wound is healing up. Goes to show just how much more resilient the animals out here are. And I'm going to go one more time and loop around and we'll get another view of them from the opposite side. Partly because at the moment I can't really look at you without looking straight into the blazing sun and squinting at you. Watch it. a very comfortable looking lion. You can see the bottom bits of his mane are all muddy and stuck together probably from having a drink at Biffle's Hook looking a little bit less well groomed than normal it always amazes me though that the manes of male lions don't look more matted than they do that is hugely dignified <laughs> that particular pose I don't know it there's a caption in that somewhere. I'm not sure if you guys can screenshot it and think of an interesting line for that. There's definitely a caption. Very sleepy looking Birmingham's. Right, now I think I'm going to do a loop around Buffleshook Dam and then return back as it starts to get a bit darker and a bit cooler. The wind's already starting to take the edge off the temperature and while I do that, let's head across to Brent and see what he's been up to while we've been with our lions. It 
So, you can see we've got a white-backed vulture in a knobthorn tree. Uh, we've come to the area where there's a few vultures' nests. I was hoping if we could have a little perusal while we have the small camera on, or say the small camera, a different camera on the vehicle. Uh, our main camera's in for repairs, and this one's got that super zoom quality, so great for looking at birds. But unfortunately, that rain has caused the trees to sprout leaves, and that is going to make it quite difficult to actually see into the nest this time. But the reason I am sitting here on our western boundary, uh, with the Arethusa's western boundary, is the wild dogs passed through here about five minutes ago. Unfortunately, they literally spent less than three minutes in our Travis area before disappearing back to the west. But if anyone knows me, I love wild dogs a lot, and it's always worth that half chance that you might find them. And always good to catch up with the vultures. And I mean, yeah, Chandra, you can't even really see the nest that leaves have grown so quickly. But the wonderful thing about wild dogs is they could chase something back in this direction. So, good to be in the area, just in case. I hear a vehicle in the bush to the west of me. Maybe it's following the wild dogs. Sounds a little bit far. But this lovely, lovely afternoon light. The bush is really crisp and clear after the rain. Uh, no dust in the sky, or little dust in the sky. So it, it, hopefully we'll find something really fantastic to put into this light. It is just magnificent light at the moment. have a sort of half look as we go under there in case the Bombay doors are open. So I do have to go through a little dip here. So there might be a little bit of signal breakup, so just bear with me, I'll be through it shortly. So we're just going to get through this little dip here quickly. about some African experience and we spoke about the man who walked from Cape Town to Cairo. What is that? Um, and uh, Alan was for the love of well-to-do family and basically said, the only way, my boy, if you, if for you to marry my daughter is if you walk from Cape Town to Cairo. Ha, 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 as a joke. So Grogan, being of very much a single mind, did it and married his daughter and became quite a prominent figure in uh, colonial Kenya after that. Now, it's a very tatty-looking flower there, but a very pretty flower. And I'm just going to go have a quick look at it. Ah, I suspected as much. 
one of my favorites. You gotta be a little bit careful. You don't wanna break the, the sap from there. The sap can actually cause quite a bit of skin irritation. But if we have a look at that wonderful sort of white and pink, it's a crinum lily. And this particular one is called a candy striped crinum. This one is uh, past its prime, I'm afraid. And they flow, only flower for a very few days after the rain. And hopefully we will be able to find some more. You see, there is still one in the center there that hasn't opened. And then this one has completely expired already. So, candy striped crinum. Uh, for those of you who like flowers, I absolutely adore them. And it has been quite a tough flower season so far with the lack of rain. But hopefully this little bit of rain will bring out the wild flowers. Guys, I'm just listening to the game drive. I'm trying to see if there's any updates on those wild dogs. I was thinking we haven't, I, I haven't visited the Arethusa waterhole since I've been back from leave, so I'm going to slowly make my way towards there, see what's been going on in that. Yeah. There seems to be very little general game around. And one has to wonder if that's because of the dogs being around. Oh, Laura, it's about one of my favorites. Uh, it is, uh, which are frogs and toads. Unfortunately, Jamie can explain the difference, and we can ask Jamie to show you. There's a bit of a fuzzy spot in the signal there. And Laura was asking, what is the difference between frog and toads? And I said, unfortunately, I don't have my frog book with me. Uh, Jamie has got it this evening, but I'll explain the difference and maybe we can get Jamie to show you a picture. Uh, so the main difference between frogs and toads is that frogs hold a gland, have a gland just behind there. Oh, John Ray is spotted. Oh, well spotted. Hopefully it hangs around. Looks to be a little red crested corn. Definitely disappearing. I'm going to look forward a bit. Try to see if we can spot it again. Oh, it's just through that. Can you see it? There's one there. Or is that a stick? Unfortunately, it has done a disappearing act, but there was a kohan there. Um, but, sorry, Laura, back to your question. So, behind a frog's eyes, they've got this really raised little patch, and it's actually a gland, and it's called a bufo gland. So you'll find most of the true toads, uh, the beginning of their scientific name is bufo. Uh, so, and what they do is they release a toxin there that's called a bufo toxin. Uh, any of you who have cats and dogs that like to play with frogs or bite frogs and you watch they start foaming at the mouth and uh, that is from that toxic gland on the behind their behind their eyes it probably tastes completely vile but is not actually won't actually kill uh, your pet so don't worry about that and the frogs lack that that gland so that is the main difference between frogs and toads 
And when we go back to Jamie, I'm sure we just ask her and she can show you a nice picture and you can see those bufo glands on the back of a toad's head very carefully. So quite a lot, often a lot of people think toads have a much more knobbly sort of warty skin uh, in, that, in some cases, but uh, there are quite a lot of frogs, a lot of your sand frogs also have those warty protrusions on their back. So it is not only toads that have those warts, uh, certain frog species do as well. It's just such beautiful light, but there's no animals to put in it. So I think we'll meander past the waterhole, and if nothing, I think we'll start heading back towards Juma, and maybe we can catch Karula before the sun goes down. amazing how quiet it is here and it's incredible how different areas are really busy at certain times and others aren't. This light so wonderful I don't think from what I can hear on the radio there's not much happening on Arethusa uh, nothing really around the waterhole so I think let's try head back towards Karula while we've still got this wonderful late evening light. calling. Yellow-eyed canary more than likely but quite far in the distance. heading to the east. Speaking about frogs, uh, Ravi's noted that on the Juma dam cam that, that frogs are extremely loud and they seem to increase in crescendo uh, after the rainfall. Uh, most definitely Ravi and I, I have planned, I've been waiting for a bit of rain because we're going to get a few more species. Uh, normally I would be out in the mud doing some frogging but I unfortunately Pete the pond hippo makes frogging a little bit risky these days but what we can definitely do we'll see how it goes tonight how many species I can hear calling and maybe we'll do a little segment just on the frog calls after dark tonight We're starting to head now back east. Uh, the wild dogs have headed further to the west, so we're gonna make our way back towards Karula. So, um, one of our long-time viewers, Penny, who's uh, from South Africa, and uh, there's a particular species of a frog we have here called a guttural to or a, fro a toad, sorry, not frog, called a guttural toad. And she said she actually had to fill in her garden pond because the noise was too much. They removed 56 toads from her little garden pond. Uh, well, Penny, I actually quite like the sound of a guttural toad. Uh, and quite often when I'm traveling, especially when I'm overseas or in Johannesburg, I will actually put on the sounds of frogs to go to sleep rather than the screeching of car brakes and howl of police sirens. Uh, 
Alright, so while we shoot towards Karula, uh, we're going to go see Jamie, who's got the frog book out, to show you the difference between frogs and toads. I'll to continue on with our answer to, I believe, Laura's question about frogs and toads. Now the interesting thing is that the term frogs, the actual frog toad distinction is quite an old fashioned and misunderstood term. Now frogs all fall into one huge order known as the Anura order that's divided into about 32 different groups and about 13 of those occur in South Africa. One of those groups, so one of those family groups is the toads, so the, what are they called again? the Bufo family, the Bufidae family, that's the toad family. Now I know that Brent was chatting a lot to you about the differences of frog, of toads, so I'll find a nice picture that I've marked somewhere in my book here. I used a blade of grass but I feel like that might have been a, a terrible error in my ways because there we go, that's what I was looking for. Typical toads. Now he spoke to you about, let's focus in here, about the glands that they have behind the eyes, the paratoid glands that excrete a toxic substance. Now the interesting thing, if we look at them, they have short squat bodies and wart-like substances all over their skin as well as those glands around the back of their eyes. And that's all features of the toad family, but it's not exclusive to them. Now the interesting things about toads is that essentially they are actually frogs. So there are types of frogs that also have that secretory ability as well as the fact that they have some other frogs, for example the puddle frog, also has warts along its skin. So it's a difficult one but typically short squat bodies, quite slender legs and warty skin with a paratoid gland makes it a toad in the frog family, if that makes sense. Now a little bit about the distinction and yes I accidentally may or may not have not stolen. I didn't steal Brent's frog book. I, I just borrowed it and kind of forgot to give it back. Actually I rescued it. Let's be honest, I rescued it out of the rain and unfolded all of the wet pages after our big storm on Sunday. So I don't feel too much in the way of guilt in that respect. I'm just doing a quick loop around onto Cheetah Cutline, and see if there's any sign of where that lioness may have moved off, off to. She hasn't come south from Bucklesop Dam, which leaves Torchwood, which seems the most likely place where she would have gone, which is off to the east of us. And I'm going to cut across there in a moment and see if maybe her tracks pop out there. And if she does head across into Torchwood, I think that's quite a good indication that it is a Styx female, or maybe at a stretch a Talamati female, rather than an Unkuhuma lioness. And the reason I say that is, as far as I know, the Unkuhumas have been moving around on Buffel's hook. So to the north, and they're a bit to the west. lions and wondering whether or not there are any white lions in this area. Something I discussed with the school group yesterday, or no it was this morning, sorry the day has just been quite long. But DJ you were wondering do we get any white lions? The famous white lions of the southern Africa region are found in the Timbavati region. Now Timbavati is off to the northwest of us but it is an area that is connected to and open to. As you know there's the huge Kruger Park that is off to the east of us, an enormous open expanse and there's lots of different other concessions around the border of Kruger that all have their boundaries open so there's no fences in between us. So although the white lion genetics are primarily based around the Timbavati there is always a chance that it could pop up around here. It's a naturally occurring recessive gene, so it's rare. 
and it's recessive so you have to have two parents mate that are carriers plus it has to through that combination combination of mitosis and meiosis that happens in the formation of reproductive cells you have to get that exact right combination and generally that percentage with two recessive alleles if we simplify it completely means that even with two parents carrying the white line gene you've got a maybe 25% chance of one so one in four of the offspring will be white lion but what's so interesting about that is the Timbavati region is quite in the far western areas of our greater Kruger concession but very recently I went across and visited with Brent while I was on leave we went across to Singita which is right on the west uh, eastern side of the Kruger boundary right on the Mozambique border and they've just had two white lion cubs pop out of a pride that they've never seen white lion genes in before and it's so interesting the way that eventually you get that Types, the really rare phenotypes popping up every now and again unexpectedly so we might say because we're not in the Timbavati we don't get those white lines but that's not true we could we definitely could it could pop up one day unexpectedly and who knows the Birmingham boys come from an area fairly close to the Timbavati region they could be carriers of that gene maybe one of the six females is also a carrier we could have white line cubs it's rare and it's, but it's not unheard of and of course the reason that it is so rare is that those individuals are at a slight disadvantage so we've seen we saw that Steenbock earlier how clearly white shows up in the bush uh, you can imagine that a white line the process works very very sim in a very similar way it's not that they lack all pigment but they lack most pigment which is what gives them the blue eyes it's not albinism so they're not completely lacking in any kind of pigment still fascinating to think about and the study of genetics to me is one of the most incredible things out here and the clever ways that nature has of making sure that everything stays fresh and then no inbreeding occurs or at least very little inbreeding occurs in a nice big natural area still keeping an eye out for this female's tracks so I want to see if she's popped back across into Torchwood and of course keeping an eye out for the female herself she might be slowly trying to sidle away from the Birmingham's whilst they're all asleep it's something that I have read about and I, I don't know if that's the case here but I have heard of situations where male lions when they first start taking over coalitions when they do meet up with the prides that are under their control that even with females not in estrus they might bully a lioness into staying with them every time she tries to leave they might chase after her and make her stay with them for a while until they realize that she's not in estrus she's not coming into estrus and they just get bored and let her leave and i'm starting to wonder whether that isn't a possible explanation behind the pattern that we're seeing with the birmingham boys where they're with one female exclusively and yet don't seem to be mating with her I wonder if they're still just a little bit too young and not quite aware of how the whole process is works out for them the wind is picking up it's actually starting to get a bit chilly I might try and put my jacket on at the same time as driving which could potentially end in a tree we'll hope not we'll try not to Ah, it's very smooth. Wrong. Obviously, along with female, dogs in particular tend to be hyper hyper sensitive to change to those changes. No sign of her tracks popping out there. I wonder where this girl disappeared off to. She's pulled a very sneaky maneuver here. my favorite 
Bridge Roads to drive down. And what a beautiful evening it's turned out to be. It's a Biffles Hook cut line where we can look across the expanse that we get to move around in and enjoy it. Amazing to feel how the temperature is dropping as I'm driving down this hill. Uh, interesting point raised by PK. We talked a little bit about the genetics behind white lions. PK, you're saying two white lions could have cubs that are not white. I need to think about this for a second. So they'd have normal colored cubs. I think that white lion genetics are a little bit more complicated than I'm making them out to be. But if it comes from two white lion parents, I think that you've got a 100% chance of having white lion cubs. And the reason I say that is that parent can only have that recessive allele otherwise if it didn't if it carried the genes for a normal baby or a normal colored baby it would be normal colored itself that's the way dominant and recessive genes work if you've got any of the dominant genes present they out they sort of overrun the recessive gene now, unless white lines are a bit more complicated than that i think if you get two white line parents breeding you're guaranteed to have white line offspring but if you've got one normal colored parent but with a recessive allele so a recessive part of that gene and then one white white colored parent then your chances of having a white line baby increases it's a little bit complicated it's something that we used to do with um with squares where we used to work it all out in biology quite difficult to do in my head and i don't remember the percentages straight away off the top of my head but somewhere around there and that makes sense to me it's recessive alleles you have to only carry those genes and as the sun makes its way down and it gets a little bit cooler I want to do a quick loop back to the Birmingham boys and while I do I believe that Brent has a beautiful sun to show you Here we go, a Karula and the sunset. Not quite the sunset shot we were hoping for, but nonetheless, oh, at least she lifted her head for us. Well, what she spotted? Is there a hyena on the way? She definitely looked up quite quickly there. I can't see anything, but she is intently staring at something. What have you spotted, madam? I must grab my binoculars. So we're the only ones here, aren't we spoilt? Um, but there is a game drive having drinks not too far away on quarantine. But well out of sight of Kula. Look at that, the African sun setting, and it's very, very different uh, from what it would have been a few days ago with all the dust. It's far more yellow. And we did promise you guys a fireside chat, uh, weather depending, but unfortunately I'm just going to move the vehicle slightly to show you why there is no fireside chat this evening. So, if we go like this,
and we should see the elephant bone from our sunrise fireside chat and the tent that's been set up for Big Cat Week and then from there we go down towards Lady Karula. So obviously she's got a kill in the tree, we don't want to disturb her and that's why we won't be having a fireside chat this evening as it's possible we might disturb her. Um, so there's another game drive vehicle that's just arrived to join us so if you're hearing that noise coming in don't worry about it. It's for Big Cat Week. Yeah. It'll be one of our studios for Big Cat Week for, for National Geographic. So there'll be uh, one of the presenters stationed in there. They're asking about the tent. So now that we've showed you where the fireside chat site is. We're just going to move the vehicle around uh, and try to get a view of Karula's beautiful visage. one or two little grass stalks in the way and hopefully you'll be able to see that very distinctive spot pattern that's made it almost spells wow between her eyes and the capital W at the beginning is the most visible of the letters of course you need a bit of imagination but what would life be without any looking back that direction. I wonder if she can hear something we can't. And you can hear the cacophony of the evening bird chorus just starting to build up. Crested and Crested Franklin. Some doves and obviously of course as soon as I mention it they all go quite quiet. So guys, chatting about Big Cat Week, um, we've got a few of the drone tests going on. Uh, we'll be starting bushwalk again shortly. So we're going to show you what the drone's seeing. So looking towards the sunset and having a look at the Drakensberg Mountains. And so we're going to go see what the drone has got to show us now. So we're looking at the sunset now and, and you can just see the Drakensberg Mountains in the distance and you can see quarantine. You might just be able to make out our little vehicles as specs next to Karula and 
so we really really high you can do it. we're doing a 360 swivel at the moment we can see all the little different game paths the little two tracks roads we use and you can see how green it is compared uh, to a few months ago when the last nature shows were and really great to have the drone up and running Andrew is grown squadron commander so he's piloting the, the drone so he's having a whale of a time I'm sure he takes his droning very seriously he's even got a special drone hat uh, that he wears he looks quite ridiculous but then Andrew always looks quite ridiculous and we're just going to do one last drone uh, before we come back ruler and from high on the sky anything there now we did see a hyena come through here last night on the sunset safari but it hasn't made an appearance again and it realized that the kill was too high in the tree but it won't stop them coming back to check this area it has a lot of hyenas in it So there's quite a, a, a discussion about certain things like this and Diane in Michigan is asking a very interesting question that has been discussed heavily uh, amongst guides probably for the last or as long as there's been a safari industry and Diane is wondering do we think that these individual animals actually recognize us or are a lot of the viewers uh, sort of giving the the animals human attributes and sort of anthropo oh, oh what's the word i'm looking for i've gone blank now anthrop anthropos and tongue tied okay but everyone i think gets the gist of what i'm saying um well even in our own camp there's people who sit on different different sides um i've been lucky enough that i've i've, I've grown up in the bush so and i've also got a father who's got an incredible amount of experience and is an animal scientist by training I don't believe these animals individual, individual, oh, recognize us individually um, and especially not with the vehicles and uh, when we're in the vehicles and stuff and especially not on foot. Uh, I think one thing that might be a bit different is elef elephants and especially when you are on foot. Um, I definitely, and then again I'm still not 100% sure, I think it's probably more how you speak, your tone of voice and how you calm, how you move around the animals. I personally don't think the animals uh, recognize us individually. Uh, I'm probably going to get in a bit of trouble from some of our viewers who are going to disagree with me heartily. But uh, even so, between the guides, it's, it's an often, often discussed topic. Uh, but yeah, myself, I think they think we're vehicles. I think they smell a lot of diesel and whatnot. And I think when they do seem to be staring straight into our souls, uh, it's more the movement, slight movement and stuff. And their eyes don't work the same way as ours. And they aren't able to pick up that detail that, that we can. And I think it's the slight bit of movements that attract their attention. Well, I'm sure this is going to cause quite a conversation on Twitter. So, um, and as I said, everyone's welcome to their own opinions. Just in my experience, from what I've seen uh, in 20, well, no, 32 years of living in the bush, but it's probably 20, 25, 26 years of remembering most of it, uh, I can't really say that an animal recognizes me or specifically the wild ones we see out on the drive. Oh, while well, the lines are up and moving, let's go straight to Jamie. 
done duck my head down we've just arrived at the perfect moment as we arrived they started yawning to get up and i wonder where these males are off to now it's amazing that it timed itself so perfectly and it was like they had some kind of unspoken communication and i think they're up and about they are definitely hungry oh my word hello boy walking pretty much on top of the tire. Look at them all going to sniff that area. What are they looking for? That's where the female was lying before. It's difficult to see but they're all phlegm and grimacing as well. Drawing the scent up, snarling their lips back to draw the scent up into that organ of Jacobson at the top of their mouths. There, that one might do it. I just want to get a hold of Peter who is back and he was just with us a moment ago. He left as they started to get up and move and he did ask me to call him back in. Look at them all crowded around there. Peter, Peter for Jamie. Uh, Peter, three of these my daughters have got up. They're all sniffing around a tree. Looks like they're going to go mobile. I'll let you know, but at the moment it looks like they're going north, away from the dam though. There's some more phlegm and grimacing. What? This is so interesting. Now this morning when you were with James, if you were watching, you would have seen all of them all of a sudden start to sniff and phlegm and grimace and then start to scent mark. And they're doing it again. I wonder if they're going to start marking and urine spraying or if they phlegm and grimacing at their own smells. Really interesting behavior to see. Or maybe there were other male lions that made their way across to Buffelsook. There you go. Perfect example. That is where the female was lying. I'm just going to hop onto the Game Drive channel. Somebody is trying to call me. Wow. Impressive. Go ahead, Tom. Um, it looked like they were going to go mobile north, but they've changed direction and are now going south. But I'll let you know, they're moving all about here. Yeah, that's affirmative. No problem, Tom. Copy that, that's perfect. I think they're just going to lala Ponzi again. Let's just see what these... What are you going to do, boys? Where are you going to go? Once we get a good view, then I'm going to answer Nathaniel's question, but there is, I think, no, I'll give it a moment. I think somebody was trying to call me on the Game Drive channel. What are you lions up to? The other one's starting to yawn as well, and that's usually a good indication that he's going to stand up. Yep, there's the foot licking. Generally big cats when they start to yawn and lick their feet and they are about to get up and move. He's done both of those things, so let's see if he does that. Come on boy. You better prove me right here. That was very inconsiderate of you. Or are you just not quite ready? Is it quite a long I suppose after a long day of sleeping it takes quite the energy to drag yourself up and off.
trying to keep an eye in every which direction. Okay, copy that. Okay, well, we've got a special surprise lined up for you. I believe that Peter Pretorius would like to say hello to all of you guys. So let's hold on one moment. I think he also has some Nat Geo guests with him as well. What I'm going to do is back up a little bit so we can see. Get him a chance to watch these incredible lions as they move through. Is that stump? There's a stump somewhere. I don't want to find it with my wheels. Here we go. Awesome. Hello. Yes. Looking your lights. You're looking at the light. Yes. <laughs> hello, everyone. Just a quick afternoon hello and. Um, my name is Peter if you're new on drive so I just wanted to say hello to you if you've been with us before I'm very excited to be back I arrived this afternoon great Mr. Graham Wellington behind us and we've got um, three fantastic guests with us and William the tracker in the back um, Molly, Jason uh, just stand by Nick. James I'll be with you we'll now tell you a little bit more about them over the next couple of days for now I'm just going to say that they're great people I flew down with them so we've gotten time to know each other and uh, they ecstatic two of them it's their first time in africa so they're loving this we've seen karula we've seen this beautiful lion so great to have them visiting they're also journalists two of them so there might be one or two stories coming out of this but we'll we'll tell you a bit more for now i just want to say hello i'm super happy to be i'm going to be here all the way through big cat week and just really really happy to be back with graham and jamie brian behind the camera the whole crew back at camp so happy to be here and look forward to the next couple of weeks in the bush with you we're going to move along, you enjoy the lions, the other vehicles want to have a look, so we're going to give you a chance and uh, we'll tell you a bit back. more about these guys over the next while and they'll tell you a bit more about us as well over the next while, so let's go. Look around, I'll see you again yeah. soon. Welcome back, it's wonderful nice. to have you. Back. Thank you, Jamie. <laughs> enjoy, I want to make some space Texans on his way. Yeah, well. that's a feminine. They just got the candy now, they're just moving around a bit. so exciting and I'm sure you're all thrilled to see Peter back out and about and looking forward to your time spent with him. We're so lucky to have incredible people coming around and through our doors every day. Let's see what these Birmingham boys have been up to. Now, one thing I want to do is just get hold of one of the other vehicles. Get in contact with them try and find Brian a nice position without driving too close to one of the boys. Let me try ship that way rather. Find my way back amongst the monkey orange. Right there, Brian. Now, I wanted to just see if I could spot the male with the injured light, with the injured eye. I can't see him, and I don't want to sit too much in this lion's space. I just want to move past him. He is nice and relaxed. All of them are licking their paws. I think that that was the preamble. Oh, now apparently Karula's up to something, so whilst I reposition, let's head across to him. So guys, Karula just got up. I'm hoping she's going to climb the tree. So we're just going to try to get into position. Bring over the scent marking. And the evening ablutions. I love it how leopards, before they climb trees, they sort of stare into the branches. Just 
And especially when they got kills, it's almost like they're checking it's still there. Just that little glance up. There we go. Get ready. Bit of yawn. Sorry you guys, just gonna be on the radio for a second. Yeah, attack some lonely station here, make your way. So screenshot guys, get ready. She's about to leap. I'm hoping she's about to leap. She could prove me completely wrong and go. Isn't she absolutely gorgeous, the Queen of Juma? It looks like she's building up with those big bellies. There we go. So quick. Let's move around. It's so graceful and agile. So I guess I'm just gonna try to get the spot back in a good spot. Looks like it took so much effort with that full belly with you. Now taking a break before going higher. See that wonderful sky behind her. Oh, looks like she might be preparing. Oh, big yawn. To make the next leap. There we go. I'm just going to see where she settles and we're probably going to have to move again. have to move around to the other side of the tree. Looks like she is concentrating her feeding on that, that side, so let's go around. Hopefully her, tree, her head isn't completely covered by that broken limb of the ebony tree. Murphy's Law, madam. Oh, she looks like she might. If she gets a little bit more comfortable, we're going to have to move back to the position we've just come from. But I think it's going to be obscured again by the tree. I 
can see exactly what she's eating. She's unlikely she'd be eating the leg. I think she's actually picked off a piece of meat that she's now feeding on. Okay guys, just on the radio quickly. Uh, there's I'm here, Tuck's making his way, space for one. I'll sneak around, see if we can get a slightly better view. the subject of female leopards, uh, Naomi would like to know when was the last time we saw Quetile. Uh, I'm not sure if she was seen while I was away, but the last time I saw Quetile was months ago. I know she has made a few appearances while I've been away, but I haven't seen her. Uh, Jandre, have you seen Quetile recently? Last time I made one to the honor, probably five or six weeks ago. So five, six weeks ago, probably the last time she was seen. At mating with Tingana. I don't know if you guys are able to hear the bones crunching. said that it seems she got onto a softer piece of meat. It's amazing how fast uh, these wild animals, specifically the cats, are able to digest meat. I mean, and she's eating a couple of kilograms in a sitting and digesting fast enough that it, within a couple of hours she's able to feed again.
So as we watch her feeding now, uh, she closes her eyes quite frequently and Barbara is wondering why do they do that. Well, Barbara, they're not completely closed. If you have a look, you can just catch the glint of the spotlight off her eyes every now and then. I mean, she does close them, but she's not all the time. She does have them open quite a fair bit. As to why they would close their eyes when they're feeding, I, I'm not sure. And I know lions definitely don't close their eyes when they're feeding. It's possible that in this situation she's she's already quite full. She's sort of just topping up and quite tired. Uh, but the only other reason could be when, especially when going into some more finicky bits of the carcass where there could be some sharp bones, it could be to protect her eyes. But even there, when it looks like they're closed, they're not actually, there is a slight slit open. They might just close them a little bit to protect in case there are any protruding bones. So we're sitting here as the sun is set, right at the last light of the evening. And Annie Brato, a very warm welcome to you Annie, who's a new viewer. Great to have you with us, I hope you've been enjoying the safari so far. Uh, Annie would like to know whether we are safe uh, in the dark next to a leopard. Annie, we are. Uh, this particular leopard has grown up with vehicles around it and has is completely habituated to the vehicles. Also the vehicle is not like being a person. Uh, it smells of petrol and oil and they cannot really see the upright or bipedal figure of man which they have an instinctive response to and so we are completely safe where we are as long as we are very respectful and I'm just going to try something while Tax is here, see what it looks like with the side light. Bit of a different angle, quite cool with the sort of lines being far more prominent, especially with the shadows. Right. I'll pop our light back on now. give you an idea exactly where we are. Um, this kills almost halfway between our two camps and no more than about 150 meters from final control. You can see it getting stuck into the carcass there uh, using her premolars and molars and when you see when she turns her head to the side, she's using them as a cutting, a cutting instrument to slice through the meat. Uh, where there's her canines and, and incisors are more for plucking. And you see how she turns her head to use those teeth. We have an incredible array of tendons and incredibly strong muscles that enables them to eat through that raw meat and bone.
So there's still quite a lot of meat left on this carcass. And I think she's definitely going to be here tomorrow morning as well. And possibly even tomorrow night. And it's really wonderful uh, for her to have such a big meal and also for us to have such a lovely stable sighting. A nice big meal like this, we know she's going to be around three or four days. Lovely evening breeze blowing through. You might be able to see the leaves moving slightly and the nocturnal insects are starting to come out in force after the rain. Can you hear some crickets, some cicadas? In the distance, I'm not sure if you guys are able to hear it, there's sort of a wah, wah. That's a grey tree frog or foam nest frog calling. Go. she's getting into some nice muscular meat there it's very difficult to see what angle uh, or what part is but from where I'm sitting I would guess it's probably that large shoulder muscle of that impala U So leopards are very adept climbers, as we can see, and I mean, they're incredibly able to hoist a prey, sometimes very close to their own body weight up a tree. And Chris is wondering if I've ever seen a leopard fall out of a tree while I've been watching. Uh, I have, Chris, um, for a couple of different reasons. I've seen it happen more than once. Uh, I've seen two sub-adults, so probably around seven, eight months old, having a huge game in a really big jackalberry probably about 9-10 kilometers from here on the edge of the Sand River and they were jumping from branch to branch chasing each other in the tree and the young male jumped on a branch that wasn't quite strong enough and he came tumbling, tumbling out and let's just say he didn't quite land on his feet didn't hurt himself but did land in quite a pile and the, at the time I've seen, only time I've seen an adult fall out of a tree uh, was a similar situation. A female up in a tree, quite a precarious tree, and a male charged in to steal her kill. And she tried to get clear, but she, she fell. Again, she didn't hurt herself. But there was some incredible footage caught uh, at Singita and of a, a, of a female leopard that both Scott and I have seen during our guiding careers called the Raven's Court female and she was defending her cub up a tree from I think it was the camp pan male I'm not 100% sure incredibly sadly we'll, we'll finish we're going to go across to the lions are on the move and the Birmingham boys are up for the night. I wonder what they're going to be up to. The oldest one has just moved off to the north. Oh, it's actually coming back. I'll try and stick with this boy for now. Let's see what he's going to do. I wonder, they're still moving around this area. They're sniffing around here. I'm trying to keep an eye in the back. Keep eyes in the back of my head to try and see what they're doing. They could well be going down to the dam for a drink. I can't follow until they've all moved because the other three are still in my way. He's off down towards the dam. And the clearest view at the moment is the one with the slightly injured ear. I want to shine the light directly in his eyes. And I'm just trying to bounce a little bit of it off him. 
licking himself. They've all been yawning. I think there's a good chance that they're going to get up now. Let's just wait and see. I can't see where those other two have gone. And I can't reposition at the moment. So let's see if this particular gentleman decides to get up and move about. Now seeing them standing, it's quite clear that they haven't eaten in quite a few days. So they will be hungry, they will be out and about on the prowl tonight, looking for something to eat. I haven't heard any reports of buffalo around here, but there are definitely dugger boys around. Here he's got that slightly cut eye that's obviously causing him discomfort. It's on his right side, which will be on your left, if he looks at us, and a floppy ear. Definitely been clashing with other males, other lions, and I think most likely it's the rest of this coalition. I, know I mentioned earlier that Andrew said they were fighting over the female a couple of days ago, which is unusual, but not unheard of in young male lion coalitions. You do occasionally get battles for dominance and hierarchy. What are you going to do, boy? Are you going to get up? I just want to get a hold of the vehicle behind me and see if the other two are lying down or what they're up to. Tom for Jamie. Yeah, Tom, are the other two, are they, are they lying down or are they still moving? Copy that, thank you. Now it does seem as though the lions are still moving, the two boys who did get up. So it is the Birmingham boys up and about for the evening. They are unfortunately going in a northwesterly direction, which is away from our boundary. Oh, big yawn. giving themselves a very good clean. It usually is a prelude to them getting up. The other two are moving. It's interesting to watch the way that this coalition decides on how they're going to move and what they're going to do and where they're going to go. I'd love to know who calls the shots and who makes the decisions. Now that the one that was quite close to me has moved off, I can actually reposition a little bit and we can get a slightly different view of them. Just see, the other car engine is off. Stop here. Oh is very thick in this block and by the time we do follow them out of it I think they're going to have crossed onto Biffles Hook which is outside of our area of traverse so we won't be able to follow them but a wonderful evening spent with them and I'm going to say a big thank you to Brian for all of his fantastic camera work this evening and of course a big thank you to all of you and we're going to send you back across to Brent for the last few moments of this sunset safari. Have a wonderful day guys wherever you are in the world. So Karule is feasting away and it's getting towards uh, the end of the sunset safari and we're quite peckish as well. Uh, hopefully we've got a delectable meal like the Queen. Hopefully mine's a little bit better done. Uh, I do like my meat quite rare, but not quite that rare. And also aged in the fridge, not in the sun. But it's been a fantastic sunset safari. I'm so spoiled to have lion and leopard, and that is incredibly, incredible elephants in that really, really big herd as they moved through with that must bull trailing them. Uh, hopefully, 
either a female comes into estrus and <laughs> he stops harassing the herd or he moves on to another herd because you could see that whole herd was under a little bit of stress from that from that big bull who was who was following them but and also fantastic timing when we arrived Karula came down and when we got back she went up so I hope you guys have really enjoyed our time with the, the Queen who I know is a very big favorite of all of yours so guys for the last few minutes I'm quite sure you'd much rather look at Karula she's much prettier than me so let's go have a look at Karula and uh, we will be with you bright and early for the sunrise safari tomorrow